My family moved to a new city and to a new house. Mom was the giddiest about our move, and she often spoke about how much of a steal we got our house for. I wondered why we had to steal a house to live in it, but I never asked anyone, and I suspected that no one would listen to me anyway. But I heard my dad tell my mom that the old family who had lived in the house had passed away in a fire. The last family had been there all but three days. No one else but my family would touch the property, as it was cheap. Dad called it an unfortunate string of incidents, because no one had suspected of arson. Dad swore to be careful, and Mom assured, I was pleased with the house, because it was big, and I had a bigger room in the new house than I did in our old house. The house creaked when you walked on it, and I liked to walk on it because the noise made me happy. We had a big backyard, twice the size of our old house at least, and I could afford to bring my friends over to play. My mom said, I missed my old friends as I was all alone when we had to move from our old neighborhood. The old neighborhood was too far away from any of my friends to visit us, and I was new in this neighborhood, so I didn't have any friends to play with. Mom said I would have no trouble finding friends because we had a beautiful new house. She said it would be a surprise. In our first week in the house, I found a friend in my room. He had the most curious eyes, and he was as tall as I was. His arms were bigger, and he walked around with a stocky stride. I sensed that he was short, but I didn't know many short people. He was dressed in a fanciful black shirt that could easily blend in with the night, and he stayed quiet as I walked into my room with my toys in my hand. Hello there, he said to me. He was seated on the floor where my toys were but I saw that he didn't touch any of them, as they had been left the same way from where I had left them. He asked me what my name was, and I told him my name, Richard. He said it was a beautiful name for a handsome little boy like me. Are you my friend? Asked him, smacking my lips to think that my mom had brought a new friend for me to play with, your friend. His curious eyes darted in the orbs, and his lips trembled with an answer which I willed to be positive. My mom said I would get a new friend. Did mom ask you to come play with me? I asked sternly, as I seized a long inhalation to catch myself. Oh yes, he stammered without hesitation, and he brought himself up from his kneeling position and started to walk to me. I asked him for his name, and he said it was Donald. Donald was not five years old, he had the type of hair that dad had on his face. Donald was nice to me, and he smiled when he walked to me. Would you like to play with my toy? I said, offering my hands out to him in charity. His hazel eyes fell onto me with a flatness, but I wasn't afraid. He was not taller than me, and he was nice. Sure, where are your parents? He asked, and grabbed my squishy toy. He held it up to his nose and sniffed it. Then he stuffed it into his mouth and bit into it. Upstairs, ready to go to bed. Hey, careful, I squealed. Honey, mom called from across the hallway where the bedroom was. What's going on in there? Donald looked into my eyes and shook his head. His lips moved, and he said to me softly, I'm fine, mom. He dictated to me, I'm fine, mom. I said it back to her, all right, sweetie. Go to bed. It's your first day of school tomorrow. Mom belted from across the hallway. Do you want to play a fun game? Donald said to me, rolling my toy on his fingertips. My innocent five-year-old eyes trained on the toy as it struck the floor and chirped noisily. Donald placed his calloused hands on my face and guided my attention back to himself. It's nighttime, and Mom says I have a day at school tomorrow. Will you come with me to school tomorrow? asked. We're friends now, aren't we? Would you not want to play with your new friend? Donald asked me, and I was convinced. My eyes glowed, betraying my simpleness, and he smiled. What game? I have toys, I said. He shook his head and put his hands out. I looked into his hands, and my face flushed with nervousness. Chugged on my saliva in my tiny throat. He outstretched his hand, and insisted. Then, I took it. When my hand was in his,
Donald said nothing, and he walked me to the door of my room and looked at me. I took the cue, and I reached out my idle hand to pull over the hinge. The door opened quietly, and Donald pulled me in after himself. His march was brisk, hurried, and I had no idea why he was walking so quickly until we got to the end of the hallway. It struck me that my new friend knew all about our house, but I insufficiently articulated the comment anyway. This is my house and nobody gets to keep it but me, he said nonchalantly as he moved blindly into the direction of the kitchen, guiding me after him, and my stomach roared with appetite. I assured he needed food, and he asked me, turn on this one. I placed my hand on the black knob of mom's cooker, and it snapped in the direction that he insisted. The surface fizzled, and then nothing happened. My mind reeled in wonder as I assumed what game it was that we were playing, so I asked him. Donald was walking away from me, inviting my step behind his by looking backwards one time and beckoning. Come, turn this one too, he said. I walked up beside him and turned on the electric cooker. The sudden blast of a switch did not invite the heat of the kitchen that I always felt when mom cooked, but I didn't think too much of it. When I had done as he asked, Donald smiled at me and grabbed my hands. Let's go outside, he said to me, and immediately we were on his march. I followed after him towards the door in a daze, unsure of what I was doing. Donald led me across the street with my hands firmly in his when a loud bang rocked the night. He then let go of my hand. It was the last time I would see my parents or Donald. The idea of cooking never sounded good to me, even as a female living alone. I used to eat from my mom's table before I moved out, and never thought I'd have to fend for myself in school, but that was my reality, and it wasn't going to change anytime soon. Although I had secondary problems, the primary one became what to eat and where to get it, so I often patronized online food vendors, which cost me a lot but were the only way out of hunger that I knew. Earlier in the morning of my 18th birthday, I had organized a party in my house after school, and my clique of friends had advised me to cook something, contradictory to my plan of just getting alcohol and snacks for the night. Unfortunately, they weren't around to help me cook something, so I was only able to contact Marie, who promised to be there earlier to help cook. Marie had no idea I didn't know the first thing about cooking so I had it all planned out to cut myself on my thumb before the evening to escape doing any work. Joined her at school as early as possible to discuss how the plan would be, but she was too busy to say much and pleaded that we postpone the conversation till later that day. I spent major hours of the day bothering and scheming on how I wouldn't have to do anything but celebrate my birthday. Moreover, I had a plan B to order from the regular store where I got my food if things didn't work out with Marie, but it was just a plan B, so I didn't put any effort into checking if it would be available. Casey, I heard someone call behind me as I walked down the hallway to the cafeteria. Turned around to see Jessica, an acquaintance I'd made last semester, but had somehow made her way into my contact list and often dropped by at my house. I guess she knew my secret because she never saw me cook and always commended my cooking, which I accepted without any explanation of how bad a cook I was, Jessica. I waved at her as she joined me, and we walked the remaining turns to cafeteria. Happy birthday, she cheered me on as she opened her arms for a hug, keeping me in her warm embrace, which smelled like donuts and butter. Thank you, Jess, I answered as she opened her arms and held my hand, and we took our first turn towards the cafeteria. I heard there'd be a party at your house tonight, she inquired, and I suddenly remembered I had forgotten to tell Jessica, because of her absence from school on the school's political duty with other schools in neighboring cities. Yeah, just friends, but you come over of course, I urged on. Oh great, it would have been sad if you didn't invite me, she chided. I'm sorry I didn't tell you earlier. I forgot, and since you're here now, there's no reason to not want you there. We cackled and bumped each other with our shoulders, 
Have you heard about David's mom's culinary school? She began, and I suddenly remembered the real reason why I never trusted nor felt the vigor to inform her of my birthday party. She loved gossiping and was unrepentant about it. I haven't. You should, since you're a great chef yourself and should be on par with her, Jessica jeered. I've eaten her food and yours, and the difference is clear. Oh, really? Raised a brow, feeling disgusted, but trapped in her enthusiastic voice on how good I was, of course, and the truth is it's one of the many reasons I'm so hyped about your birthday, Jessica blushed. Can't stop thinking of it, and whenever I try the sweet savor of whatever you're going to cook threatens my taste bud. That's enough poetry, I cackled, beginning to fear the reality of the situation. There would be food, I affirmed with a shaky voice, hoping she would just quit the food talk and talk about something else, even football. I'd be more interested in that than cooking. I'm glad to have known you, Cass, as she would often call me. I'd come hungry as well, she finished, and completely cracked me up as we walked into the almost filled up cafeteria. I was doomed to have to eat with her when I suddenly spotted Marie and my other friends sitting around with a space reserved for me. Excuse me, I said, and left her without hearing a reply to join Marie and my other friends. Cassie, they called out as I approached them with my food at hand and joined them at the table. Before I was able to sit down, they began singing a birthday song that suddenly echoed around the cafeteria. At this point my fear intensified, because the more people knew about my birthday, the more people at my house, which means cooking is now a priority. I went home hurriedly after school to get ready for the party later that night, and when everything was set, I called Marie, but mysteriously her phone wasn't going through. I kept calling with beads of sweat forming all over my body. Quickly hopped on plan B and called my food vendor to deliver 50 packs of different foods in their store, but I realized the world was against me when they hung up on me, claiming they were too busy. I sat depressed and sad. While I scrolled through my phone thinking of who to call next, I came across a food delivery app that I had downloaded months ago and since it was an apartment, and they had a package plan ready for 50 people in their plan, I made an order and it arrived promptly. My secret was saved by this food app, and there was no way I could show enough gratitude as I separated it into dishes, and friends started trooping in for the long-awaited party of the month. An hour into the party, everyone was merry, and the food had been set, so everyone joined in and quickly dug into the food from the serve-yourself tray. It was all going so well, until I suddenly heard about someone slumping in the toilet while defecating. We quickly rushed him out to an ambulance waiting and returned to the party, though everyone was worried about him. We had barely spent 10 minutes after the ambulance left when people began slumping and fainting without anyone to help. Within 30 minutes, everyone was on the floor looking sick and lifeless, like someone was watching. Before I could call the police, they had arrived and arrested me. I learned from the prison that over 20 people died of food poisoning on that day, and many had serious injuries in their lungs and liver. In conclusion, only Jessica, Marie and I survived the food poisoning, and both of them were at the party, but I didn't see them. What's more, an investigation found that the food app I'd ordered from never existed, My name is Roger and I am 44 years old now. I used to be a soccer player on a professional level. He even played in Europe for a while. I was smart and responsible enough to save and invest enough money so that I could have a comfortable life after retirement, which in this kind of job happens very soon. I kicked my last official ball when I was 41. This was only one year after me and my wife got divorced. We were happy enough, but sometimes things end when they end. Plus, we had a son, Andy. Since I was retiring so young, and my wife, Fub, who was only 32, still had many plans and goals to pursue in life, it was decided that Andy would live with me. 
In spite of the usual visitations and vacations with his mother, etc., the usual deal. I had money, I was young enough, and I was retired, but I had a son and I was going to raise him, at least for the most part, by myself. Andy was nine years old by that time. Back then we lived in an apartment, big and pleasant enough, but I thought that it was time to move on, leave the past behind. Me and my son needed new memories, and what better place to start another chapter than in a new house. After a couple months of searching, we finally found a house that pleased us both, father and son. It had two floors and it was close to the beach. Dad, I love it here, my son said in his first night, when I was kissing him goodnight after he went to bed. I'm glad you do, Andy. Think we made a great choice. We'll be very happy here. Sleep tight, son. Pleasant dreams, I replied before turning off the lights. After one month though, I soon realized that I needed someone to help me with all the endless domestic tasks. I had time, but I definitely didn't have the skills or experience. I decided to hire a housekeeper who would be in our house eight hours per day, like a normal daily job. Interviewed quite a few women across all ages. There was one, however, that was particularly nice and had experience with children. She was a Russian immigrant named Stutlana. Your references are very good, Stutlana. Especially for someone so young, 28 years old, I said. Thank you, mister. I came to the United States when I was 23, and I already had worked in Western Europe as a full-time housekeeper. Also took care of children and even elderly people, the young woman answered. Andy seemed to like her a lot, even since that first meetup. Svetlana did have one of those empathic personalities. It was easy to understand how she was good with people and children in particular. Her English was also very good. Very well. Thank you for coming. I will contact you within the next week, whether I'm interested in your services or not. I never leave people without an answer, I said being sincere. Thank you, sir. That's good to know. I will be waiting for your word then, she said, before leaving. As expected, it wasn't hard to make the decision. Andy also agreed that Svetlana appeared to be a great choice. She's very beautiful, Dad. I can't wait until my friends see her, when she takes me to school or when they come here to play with me, Andy said. Boys will be boys, I thought, with a smile. Within two weeks, Svetlana was working in our house. She quickly adapted, as did we. She arrived in the morning and would prepare breakfast. Then sometimes she would take Andy to school, while other days I made it my job to take him. Svetlana would return in the afternoon and do all sorts of chores. She would also go shopping, and she cooked. By the time she left at 5 p.m., everything was perfect. I just had to heat dinner a couple of hours later, and of course, usually on the weekends, she had her days off, but sometimes we would change her schedule. Months passed by and everything was perfect. Me and Andy were happy, also going out a lot, dinner, movies, etc. We also visited my ex-wife, Fove, who was living and working in another state. You both seem to be doing great. I'm almost jealous of that Svetlana. I can't wait to meet her. And also your new house, through the pictures, I can already tell I'll definitely like it, Phobe said. Eventually, I started dating other women. Svetlana would stay home with Andy during those few nights. This only happened once a week. I was paying her for the extra hours, of course. And since she was still single and didn't have her family in the United States, she didn't mind. It was now one year since Svetlana came to work in our house. I needed a special favor from our housekeeper. I wanted to go out for a whole weekend. I was dating a woman for a while, and I wanted to take things to another level. It's just for two days, Svetlana. I'll leave on Friday and come back on Sunday in the afternoon. You can have Monday and Tuesday off, I said. Very well, mister. I'm happy to help. 
and I enjoy spending time with little Andy, she replied. And so it was arranged. I had a great time in that weekend with my girlfriend, Daphne. When I returned home Sunday, I was even excited about the idea of talking to Andy about her and to arrange for them to meet. No one was home. I assumed they had gone for a walk. It was still relatively early, but after a couple of hours, I was starting to worry and I called Svetlana's cell phone. It was turned off. My son also had one I called Andy. It was also turned off. I panicked and contacted the police and answered all their questions. Svetlana was now being persecuted by the authorities. Three months later, there was no sign of Svetlana, but my son Andy was found. Ironically, on a beach. For some morbid yet logical reason, it was an outcome that I was expecting. With grief in my heart, I had to contact my ex-wife, who now hated me from the core of her heart. That day, I got a call from the police. They had found some vital information regarding my son. I hurried off to the station. I'm afraid we have some very disturbing information. Please sit down, the detective said, as I sat down in front of him in his office. We conducted an autopsy, of course, and we made a gruesome discovery. Some of your son's internal organs were removed, including the heart and the two kidneys. It's a safe assumption that your housekeeper is a part of an organ trafficking organization. And after gaining her trust, she waited patiently for the right moment to act. I'm sorry. We will keep looking for her. Hopefully, at least, we can bring her to justice sooner or later. I couldn't even react properly to the detective's words. Still can't, 